I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. If you listened to the show last week, you had heard my conversation with a young artist named Selma Carrion. I remember one part of the conversation I was asking her when she was making shirts for people with some of her drawings on it. And I was like, do you screen print them? And she said, no, she does them by hand. She talked about drawing directly on dog bowls. She just applies what she does to anything. And I'm guessing that's why she's inspired by Banksy because it's like he would do it wherever he could. Or they, depending on what your theory on who Banksy is. I'm not really gonna get into that. But it reminded me that I actually used to do that for a living. I actually used to hand paint t-shirts. I worked at a place that if you've been around in Madison long enough, it was called Artwave. And one of the things we did is you'd come up and go, I want this on a shirt. And we would paint it for you and give it to you. Most of the time that turned out to be like some stupid Calvin and Hobbes thing. It was just interesting that she reminded me of something that I used to do that somehow I had just forgotten over the years. Why did I forget that? Why did I start doing it differently? What made me lose that set up and do it sort of attitude? Which is what I really liked when I was talking to her. Now this week, I meet a guy who makes large scale things. They, they go from large to giant outside pieces. But he's also realistic. He pairs down the skill that he has and makes jewelry as well and sells them in some of the shops around town. And oddly enough, from what I got from this conversation, is it all started when he was in training to be a sushi chef. I had to say that pausingly because that's a difficult thing to say together. Sushi chef. Oh, that time I did it. So have a listen as I meet Jason Scott. Are you from Wisconsin originally or where, did, where do you come from? I'm actually not. I'm originally from uh, Dubuque, Iowa, where I went to uh, art school at Clark University. And then after graduation, I moved to Milwaukee. So I was in Milwaukee for about 10 years and then relocated to Prairie du Sac in, well, five years ago. So I've been in Prairie du Sac for five years now. What brought you to Milwaukee? I, I was pursuing grad school at UW for sculpture and I actually was kind of courting a company called Flux Design. Okay. And it was kind of like my dream job that I chased and I ended up getting it. But in the meantime, became um, a sushi chef sort of um, on the side. Really? Which I've been doing for about 15 years as well. So it was kind of like the day job equivalent of a sculptor to learn some of the trade like that while I was kind of doing the metal work and learning how to build things really on like a professional level, which is what Flux Design did. It was a professional sculpture and... Um, restaurant tour uh, design build firm so like they built a lot of nightclubs bars like all the cool places to hang out in milwaukee are pretty much done by flux design so it was kind of a celebrity type company to work for uh -huh. and i learned i learned more in about six months about metal work from them than i learned in my four years of undergrad uh -huh. or what i thought potentially could happen in grad school so it was like kind of a win-win so they built restaurants and designed places like that and then you ended up also doing sushi chef stuff Right. And I, it actually kind of transposed a little bit here and there as uh, friends of mine opened, would open sushi bars. I would do some of the interior work, some of the artwork for it, and then work at the restaurant as well. So oh, wow. That was a while ago. That was in my 20s when I had a lot of energy. <laughs> <laughs> but still, that's kind of interesting how the two kind of coexisted together. Do you just show up one day and go, I'm going to be a sushi chef? Like, how did that even come into play? Well, I took Japanese um, in, in college for a couple semesters and... I was had this sculptural background, so uh, I was trained by a master chef, but I had to like start out bussing tables. It was uh -huh. very much a like respect issue before. He'd never trained a white guy before, let's put it that way. And Interesting. There, there was only a couple of us in the city of Milwaukee at the time. Obviously, this is 15 years ago, so it's exploded now, and there's a lot of different um, cross-cultural dissemination of of information that wasn't available before YouTube. It was kind of like a right. secret handshake type thing where you had to be trained or you didn't just you couldn't just find a content on how to do it. And the facts like an apprenticeship sort of thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Huh. I guess I never thought of it. That. I mean, it makes sense having to teach you like certain skills or I'm sure that there are certain ways that you have to do it that. Yeah, that I guess a master would have to do. And there are ways to do it in the United States, or at least even then there were ways to achieve that level from like a culinary institute. Yeah, that specialized. There was a couple schools that specialized in it, but they're on the West Coast and. 
nobody ever really went that route. It was more, it's more the apprenticeship thing. And I, I've known a couple of chefs in Chicago who have kind of done the same thing that they kind of got taken under their wing and uh, or under a master chef's wing and worked really hard for a really long time. Uh-huh. Like the master chef would give you all the uh, not so fun stuff to do to learn. Right. Of uh, course. Work your way up the chain, chain of knowledge at the time. Again, now it's like you can look on YouTube and figure out how to do it. <laughs> yeah. At the time then, it was like you got little bits of information, you know, as you progressed throughout the year or two that you were apprenticing. And yeah, it was a good time. But in the end, I think when I started working for, for Flux Design, that became much more demanding. So my wife and I started our own sushi catering company called Handover Fish. <laughs> and, uh, nice. It was pretty successful. And we were able to we were able to do a lot of parties on the weekends without having to have that second shift schedule and a first shift schedule. Oh, that's great. We'd do parties and dinners and stuff on the weekends with a lot of the people who were involved in the restaurant groups that we were building interiors for as well. A lot of furniture. There was quite a bit of sculpture involved too. We did a lot of benefits for second harvest. Um, Feed your soul was a big benefit that drew about a thousand people every fall into our shop. They had a couple gallery spaces as well. So it was it was really a great deal um, for, for an artist to have these connections at the time back in um, you know the mid-2000s. Then the economy tanked in 2008. The company didn't do very well. They're still, they're still going, but they're still in debt. And it's, um, it was time for me to get out then. I was having children at the time too. So I pursued more of a stable welding job in, uh, in sanitary stainless steel welding as my day job. And then Art kind of took a backseat to children for a little while. And then I kind of, you know, blew up the Dubuque scene a bit because I had connections there. Started showing a little bit more with through my connections in Milwaukee. Haven't really branched out into Madison much because I'm not really sure the avenues to pursue there. Mm-hmm. But whenever I have the time to make work, I do a pretty good job of selling it or at least showing it in either of those two cities in Dubuque or Milwaukee. That's what brought you to Prairie du Chien, you said you're in, right? Prairie du Sac. Prairie du Sac, so, sorry. Um, my wife's folks are from the Mesomani area, and her sister and brother-in-law and their kids are in Madison. It seemed like a good place to buy a house and raise raise a family, and also we could, I could get a place would have that, that had access to a couple shops that I could build for a lot less real estate than than Madison or in Milwaukee even or whatnot. That makes sense. So it's kind of a family family choice, but also like it's nice to have a corner lot with a yard and a garage and all that too without having to get into that $300,000 market where you'd get that in Madison. What would you say the medium and style of what you do would be called? It's definitely like a mechanical, mostly stainless steel foam and resin is what I work with now. Sort of sci-fi mechanical, say it would be like some sort of description of the type of work I do. Although I do do a bit of commission work, sign work, stuff like that, that's more tailored to an individual client or a customer's wants. But generally, they like my style, so they want something that's in my style but fits their signage needs. And how did you get started in sculpture and that stuff? I was very interested in art at a young age, and I pursued a apprenticeship through the Clark Clark University while I was in high school outside of school, independent study with one of the instructors, put together my first sculpture show in high school, which was, had never been done at my high school before. And it was, I think, 12 pieces. Wow. Very influenced by the Matrix as nice. that would have been, that would have been common in 1998 when I graduated. But those ideas kind of continued through college and I ended up minoring in philosophy and doing a joint philosophy show with my sculpture show, which was called Simulacrum, which is the book by the philosopher, I'm going to blank on his name now, the, uh, the book called Simulation and Simulacra, which is what The Matrix was um, based on, was really? based on this book, the idea. I didn't know that. He comes up with a lot of really cool ideas. He kind of predicted the, the handheld screens, hmm. the way that media would be disseminated in terms of content, like no longer half hour shows with 10 minutes of commercials. It'd be more like three to five minute clips of things and kind of what social media has become now. He is kind of referencing all that back in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. So a really smart guy. Can't remember his name, darn it. (laughs) So those kind of things influenced me early. And I think I just kind of stuck with those same principles as more and more of the sci-fi in our world uh, becomes fact, becomes science fact now. And we're, it's an alarming rate. It's kind of a breakneck speed of technology right now. It's both exciting and a little bit scary. And I think, I think everyone sort of feels that 
sort of that post millennium tension of like what's next sort of thing. So I've kind of stuck with the same sorts of subjects that influence the technology, the mechanics, moving towards like an, an AI or moving towards an Android that has fleshier, it's a fleshier machine, I yeah. guess, is where, I'm, is where I'm headed with my work. So it's basically just the same same ideas I've been working in for about 15, 20 years now, but I'm just refining them more as my craft develops. Okay. As I learn more and get better at things, like it's, it's just a better way to communicate the same sorts of messages. I'm looking at some of the, of the stuff. You do larger works and then you also do like jewelry works. Mm-hmm. I got into that as a means to sort of put things together. I got, I was, I, I made my wedding bands. And under a Japanese technique called uh, mokume gane, oh, which cool. is a uh, melding of copper and stainless together, or copper and nickel. So it looks like uh, Damascus knives would be a, an example. You'd probably be familiar with that folded metal look. But I made those, and then I kind of got hooked on the jewelry thing for a little bit. And it's also a way to do smaller side projects for commissions that are not so expensive. Because since I'm still working in stainless steel, a lot of the smaller stuff, because the material cost is low, I'm able to sell pendants for... 30 or 40 dollars even though they're so somewhat complicated or simpler for you know the 20 to 30 range and i was going the etsy route with that at one point again around like 2008 to 10 when the economy wasn't really strong i found i couldn't keep up with the handmade stuff oh. for the market demand that i was getting so it's like my stuff was really popular but i couldn't keep up enough and i was getting bad reviews with the yelp and whatnot you know, really yeah, if you if you can't keep up, if you can't turn things around in five days or something, you know, people start to whine and bitch about it. Huh. And I'm not sure if it's Yelp. It was probably just reviews on just Etsy. reviews. Okay. But it's the Yelp format, I guess, is what kind of got me. Gotcha. But yeah, I do um, larger stuff. I have a few pieces that have traveled that have been installed for the Dubuque Art Walk on the river, one in North Carolina. So it's bigger stuff that takes a little bit more to install. I got a few pieces that are in my backyard that are more larger than life size. Yeah, where do you keep all this stuff? I have a backyard, it's nice. <laughs> and it's, which is very handy when you're not installing or displaying or whatnot. I can just kind of clutter up my backyard. Because even as we're talking right now, I mean, I'm seeing two of the pieces right behind you and then uh, some of the pictures you sent me. I've talked to all these people and they have art hanging and stuff and it's like, hey, where do you store it? How are you promoting yourself? You created the shop. You build the shop doesn't mean that people go, oh my God, look at here's this new shop that uh, is on Etsy. There's 10 million of them. How, how did you promote yourself right. and get the word out there? I didn't really try very hard. And in fact, that's one thing really? that I think I don't really promote myself that well. And I haven't really had to. It's just sort of come with the, like the work speaks for itself type thing. Like when I have the time and I want to put together a show, I do it when I need to sell something or want to sell something I can, but I still have that stability of my day work that really pays the bills. So Mm -hmm. I haven't had to, like a lot of artist friends I know, um, two in particular that I can think of, Katie Martin Muir or Adam Muir. Katie Martin Muir teaches at MIAD, the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, and she also teaches at UW-Milwaukee. She's put up a couple stainless steel pieces in Madison. She's one of the better, I think, productive working artists in Wisconsin. When I see the, how their lives kind of have unfolded, mm-hmm. it made me kind of go the opposite direction. When I saw that she had to teach at two different art schools without tenure because nobody would give quite enough hours to get good insurance, mm-hmm. but still doing what you love and being successful and having lots of shows, but really having to put so much effort and so much work into it. And she's an installation-based artist, so most of her money comes from grant writing for the install. She's not actually selling any work. Yeah. So there's all that kind of paperwork that goes behind that too. And whenever I want to do a public sculpture installation or if I want to compete in some sort of competition to get a stipend or to get finances to install something or build something, that process takes quite a bit of time. It's not something that I do every day and live every day, although I do think about making art all the time. It's yeah. still like it's still in my soul, but the actual physical production of it is not necessarily as intense as what other artists in the state might be doing who do it all the time as their primary source of income. And which I think for me, it allows me to spend more time on the work taking maybe a year or something to complete a piece, but doing it really well, Mm -hmm. as opposed to having to meet a gallery's demands. You know, usually like when you deal with a gallery, you, you have to guarantee that you can make X amount of pieces make X amount of shows per year under their contract. And then they're still taking 40 to 50% commission for, of course, selling the work for more than you would probably sell it on your own. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of obligation and a lot of stress that goes into something like that, where you have to always be making pieces all year long, all the time. Family life, it doesn't necessarily uh, afford me the free time or the finances that I can have 
doing something every day that I love, which is tungsten welding. Plus, okay. the shop that I work in is pretty relaxed, and I have access to a very expensive material at a great reduced price because they have a lot of drop, they have a lot of scrap that I'm able to buy for for weight instead of by length. That alone, probably, if I were an art teacher and I made, let's say, $45,000, $45,000 a year, but I had the summer off, that's great. But now when you, when you factor in your material costs to continue to make work outside of the facility or even at the university or whatnot, you're talking another ten dollars to $20,000. Yeah. So it becomes an economics issue, I think, the older we get, at least for me anyway, as I've progressed. I've lost my butt on, on some art. I've given a lot away. I've I've made pieces that went for a lot more than I thought that that they would. But when you have to move that stuff a few times, like you were saying, yeah. you kind of get like, where does where does all this stuff go that I'm not selling? That's and true. Not showing and yeah. Now I have storage and space to do all that. How are you finding galleries to put your stuff at? It sounds like you keep it kind of consistent, but how are you finding them? Off and on, um, I do still use uh, my Flux Design Connections because they have two galleries. Um, that are above restaurants in the third ward in Milwaukee, which is okay. very much the arts district. I've also found a lot of success in using bar restaurants as a venue instead of actual gallery spaces. Oh. They're only charging like 25% commission. You get a lot more foot traffic, not necessarily art collectors, but similar like-minded people who are going to the same hip or trendy place probably have the same sort of taste or aesthetic when it comes to art. So. Huh. I found that those pieces sell quicker and I don't mind reducing the price a little bit too to get art into the hands of younger people. It's a different culture for sure, but it's one that I'm very familiar with. Now I'm finding that it's just a little bit more accessible uh -huh. and you can rotate whenever you want. Most restaurant owners are happy to have anything on their walls that that is that they're not paying for. I know um, Trent Kramer, the owner of The Vintage. Oh, right. He's, he's building a massive vintage right now um, in Prairie de Sac, Sauk City. Oh. And we've already, he's a welder as well, talked extensively. I'm probably going to get to do the opening uh, of the restaurant. I'm probably going to get to fill the walls with whatever I want first. That's really cool. Have, have first dibs. So that'll be nice and that'll be fun. But it's a lot of, a lot of places I think like that tend to try to rotate things around more and get, get yeah. things fresh. So there's a lot of places you can kind of hop around. And I think, you know, Madison, should I tap that market now would be a great place to do that because it seems like, you know, every couple of months we have four or five new restaurants. And I've, I'm thinking that the next market that I'm tapping now is like high-end yard art. So I'm making museum quality or gallery quality complicated pieces that have a lot of detail to them. Okay. But they're stainless steel and they're roughly like human-ish size and they're like yard art pieces. So it's kind of bringing the high and the low medium together. It's visible because, you know, it's going to be something that you see every day or people see every day. It's so, it's, so it's for everyone, I guess, not just, you know, for your own walls inside your house. But then you have this level of like high, low art, like the quality is there, mm -hmm. but the price really isn't because again, like I, I'm able to extend a lot of discount of what, you know, my time is essentially more than my time and materials like it is for a lot of artists because I can get such a good deal on, on size and weight and things. So I'm able to you know pass that reduction on to, you know, any potential clients. It's an interesting angle though, too, because you're basically saying they're meant to be displayed outside so people will see them. So it's kind of like what you were saying with the restaurants that it's going to be foot traffic. I mean, the first thing yes. I thought of, because I was going to make a joke about it, like, is it going to be like those cowboy silhouettes that people have on the side of their garages? That's what I'd like it to be. I'd like it to take over that kind of, I mean, there's so many, there's so many, um, rebar blue, blue glass bottle racks, you mm -hmm. know, in people's yards that if people are willing to spend 50 to a hundred dollars on something that's like, I can make it five minutes, give me $300 and I'll give you 40 hours and you can have something that looks like a fine piece of art. But. And people with yards love to set them up to look a certain way. And if they do that, other sure. people are going to look at it and be like, Oh, Jim's yard over there. Look at that cool thing he has in it. We need one of those. It spreads around. No, that's actually kind of yep. an interesting idea. And it also allows me to work at my own pace too. Again, like because of the day job, because of the children, because of, you know, doing multiple things, sushi, jewelry, sculpture, like I need to, for me, it's a matter of being able to not have to stress about finishing something for a certain deadline or whatnot yeah. until I have a customer or a client who says, hey, can you make me one of those? Absolutely. What's your time frame? How do you get commission work and how fruitful would you say it is? I would say like most of the work that I do, it's as fruitful as I want it to be. Okay. I don't necessarily advertise well. I don't promote myself maybe as well as I could or should. 
But right now I'm working on a fine art piece for um, the owner of the Bigfoot zip line in, uh, in Wisconsin Dells. All right. And that's a job that I got while working at the sushi bar, my friend's sushi bar in the Dells that I actually helped do some work for there too. So where regular customers come in, they see a couple of the art pieces I have in this restaurant and like, wow, I'd love to have something like that for so-and-so. Uh, for this business, that would look really great. Can yeah. you do it like this though, or can you change this a little bit, or can you make it like this? And of course, yeah, we can all, we can work with any any parameter you want. I would say that family and friends. I mean, social media has been huge for commission work for me. I think Facebook. I made a mailbox for my sister in law that's just real flashy and real techy, and had all these kind of gizmos and stuff on it that just looked like way over the top. And it's it's a stainless steel mailbox. It catches a lot of attention. Okay. So that as soon as I put that on Facebook. 20 or some pictures of that or whatnot, then it was, I want one. I want one. I want one. Okay. Yeah. Well, what are we willing to pay first off? Like, cause these take time. There's a lot of detail involved in here. If you look online, if you look on the internet, I actually researched quite a bit about um, the stainless steel mailboxes. Cause I wasn't sure if I wanted to fabricate the shell. If I just wanted to do a lot of detail work and I was, I was thinking about purchasing just the, the mailbox shell and I couldn't find one for under $600 for a stainless steel, like mailbox. Really? Well, wow, I'm in the wrong business. I should just just make mailboxes for like half that and probably <laughs> yeah. retire early. <laughs> That's definitely yeah, social media. Social media is huge for, for things like that, I think, is the I want one, like, oh, that looks great. You know, so there's, it's the circle of family and friends. And as that expands and grows, so does so does the business. And again, if you want it to, I tend to I tend to rely more on things like that because then I can just talk directly to the client about okay, what's your time frame? You know, mm. what's your budget? It's, it just takes, again, it takes the stress off of having to produce something under some sort of contract. There's something relatable to at least my generation and younger that more people are doing things like that. People get to support their, their local artsy anarchist. They tend to more so than, than getting another Chuck Close print or something like that. You mentioned before that you had a studio space. Are you paying for one? Do you have one of your own? No, that was kind of why, what, what drew us to the property that we have right now is I have a garage that my wife was told the first day that we got the house that there would never be a car in the garage. That was gonna be <laughs> <laughs> and then also um, uh, the house we bought was a woodworker's project house at the time in the 60s oh, that's so handy. he had the basement set up as a wood shop at one point anyway and then he had another shop off to the side so the basement's essentially one large shop as well wow and because i do because i do a lot of low temperature um tig welding that's very precise and there's no soot or smoke or anything like that really just a, a minor minor amount of fumes especially with the micro welding type uh, practice that i use I can weld inside in the basement as much as I want without having to really deal with any ventilation systems or anything like that. So I have two shops. I have one in, one for the summer in the, in the garage, and then I have another shop in the basement for the winter. Do you write that off at all? Because I talked to somebody recently who does most of the work. Her studio is actually her living room, and she got mm -hmm. a tax person and found out that that's actually a tax write-off because it's still considered the place where you sell work out of. That's something to look into, though. I might, might throw up a red flag to the IRS for any sorts of work that I'm doing that's not <laughs> so, so yeah following double edged sword there yeah okay I get what you're saying <laughs> you said that when you had kids before when you were in Milwaukee and then you decided to move now did that put a halt on your art are you getting back into it or have you always consistently done it you always know? consistently done it but yeah there's definitely been some lulls I would say I really dove back in in 2013 and that was when my second son was about a year and a half. As soon as it was like, you know, the newborn periods are over and kids are a little bit, I was, I was able to get out and work again a lot more. But I've always done something that I think is, a lot of people think it's strange at work, but the shop that I work in, the welding shop that I work in at work during the day, I can work, in my, I can work on my own stuff during my lunch hour as well. They kind of just don't mind that. And I think they also see it as good for morale too, to see somebody who's like doing something other than just mechanical welding or assembly. Like, Hey, this guy, what's he going to do today? What's he going to, what's he going to throw together today? So for the last five, the last six years I've worked for that company, I've spent 15 minutes of my, of my half hour lunch break, always doing something, always making something. And it takes time, but I've been able to make large pieces in just a couple months time on just my lunch break time alone. So it's not even cutting into any family time or whatnot either. Just got to find the time. You have to make the time to do it. Larger stuff take longer when you have to work in smaller increments of time. You know, if my wife wants to watch Orange is the New Black, which I don't really care about, I might just go into the shop and work for an hour or so. 
yeah. things like that. It's just a matter of getting that time or making that time. You know, with all that free time being used for creating or working on projects or being with family, I mean, how do you manage a, a budget if you're using all your free time for this? There's alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> there sure is. <laughs> And yeah, and, and, and my wife just said, and a wife who likes to pay bills, like yeah. she likes to take care of the business stuff of the family, which I had forever indebted for because yeah. as the artist artist mind, like that is not what I think about on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I, I take care of the basic stuff that needs to happen and the fine semantics of family life, household business stuff. That's, that's her thing. So that's really fortunate for me. And her dad's a carpenter. Um, I've always considered her an artist. She and I have worked on lots of projects together. Cool. Um, but she doesn't consider herself an artist. I beg to differ. Um, <laughs> but she she's always, she's the first person I go to when I'm when I'm dealing with aesthetics or like oh, going this way with this, this way with this. What do you think? And she always has like a response immediately. Like, nope, you should do it this way. This is what's going to look the best. Like, this is how it's going to work out better. This is the. Did you think about this? How yeah. about how about X and Y? Like, she's got that. So whenever I second guess myself or doubt like she's right there to figure it out for me that's so handy to have yeah and the feedback and also the fact that they've been around what you do that they know where you're coming from seeing you do whatever for some reason i'm swinging my arm up and down like you're like this is how you weld um <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing too it's something i've always wanted to try working with fire i mean you you work with fire mm -hmm. right yeah yeah a lot of grinders a lot of um i mean it's more TIG welding is more focused. It's like a focused pin of arc, which is like, it's very quiet. You're not really throwing around the torches that are live fire. It's more of that controlled short circuit. Oh, okay. That's the, the electricity that's doing the melting. And it's it's a lot more precise and clean. Although, I mean, I do a lot of torch work too. A lot of heat bending. Stuff that's not going to bend unless you heat it up first. So there is some torch stuff involved. Is there anything that you'd like to mention that we may not have covered today, projects or things coming up or stuff that maybe doesn't even have to do with what we're talking about that you'd like to mention? I have one thing that is both related to art and a very personal issue. Okay. My nephew, who's eight years old, was diagnosed last year with a super, super, super rare muscle and bone disorder called FOP. There's only 800 people in the world that have this disease. To simplify it, what happens is when he's injured, when he gets bumped, when he gets a bruise, that part of the muscle calcifies and turns into bone. Eventually, he will turn into, he will have an entire exoskeleton around his skeleton, all made out of muscle. So we created a fundraiser last year called One Rare Boy. One Rare Boy has been doing a lot of events in Madison. We are up to about $30,000 we've raised so far in the last year from different functions at Brasserie V or Plan B, we did a, an event. So I've donated a lot of jewelry to the cause that you can buy at Change Boutique on Willie Street. Another friend is running the Iron Man. Um, the Iron Man this year, he's, he, or I shouldn't say running, but he's doing the Iron Man this year under Eli, my, my nephew, under his cause, One Rare Boy as well. So we have like merchandise for that. We got hats and shirts and stuff like that. Just, we been kind of trying to do whatever we can because it is just so, so strange that this has happened to us and our family. And yeah. we're using every avenue we can to kind of come up with money because when, when diseases are this rare, funding for research and cures and medications tend to come from the families involved Yeah, because there's not a lot of budget for things that are that only affect a couple people in the United States. We're doing what we can. There's some new drugs in the market that are very promising, and he should be able to start treatment of those in the next year or so. The saddest part is when you have a really active kid, you know, eight years old, likes to play baseball, likes to play basketball. Like, well, you can go swimming now. And that's <laughs> right. You can't afford to get hit with anything. One thing I'd like to mention is that there was a fundraiser for Eli, but it happened the day before the show was released. But you can still donate to the cause, like Jason said, at onerareboy.com. I'm happy to hear that in a few years, there may possibly be a way to help change all this. So again, go to onerareboy.com if you'd like to help out. And here's another interesting, odd sort of synergy thing that happened with this conversation. I'm actually tonight meeting friends to go out for sushi for the first time in my entire life. They are literally taking me out to specifically have sushi, me and my wife, because we've never had it. I would say not because we didn't want to. No, we've never wanted to go get sushi before, but they are making us do it. So we figured we'd finally, you know, since we're trying new things, 
We're gonna go try sushi. I don't know how that will turn out. Probably be all right, I'm assuming. Aside from that, it was really nice to meet Jason. I don't think I've ever met somebody that makes sculptures and objects of that scale before. So thank you very much, Jason, for talking with me. And if you're listening to this show for the first time, you can learn more about it at AmericanBandito.com. And also, on the site, you can read my daily comic journal called Then This Happened, the story of my wife and I this summer going through breast cancer as I journal from day to day about it. And you can check that out at AmericanBandito.com slash comic. The music for this show is by Romcom, and that's com with two M's. You can hear more at romcomtheband.com. And if you would like, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or YouTube. You can find all of those links at americanbandito.com slash subscribe. There's still a lot of people for me to meet. I'll see you next week. So long. <laughs>